No working, no household choice, no washing your hair, no bathing with regular water, no bare feet, no cold food, no air conditioner, no going outside, can, cannot cry. These are some of the important rules to follow when choosing to do Chinese confinement. I'm Taylor, a 33-year-old new mom who just gave birth in Hong Kong. First of all, congratulations on your new baby, Taylor, from one Canadian to another. I'm Dr. Yan Yu, a family physician in Calgary, Canada. I'm reacting to Taylor R's video on Chinese confinement because I thought it did a remarkably good job at explaining a practice that many in the West may find shocking, but which is totally normal for literally billions of other people around the world. During the new mother can't leave the house for a month. What? In this video, I will react to and provide a medical perspective on Taylor's experiences. And this is what my life looked like after that. Now her video was half an hour long, so I'll only be reacting to the most interesting and fascinating and most medically relevant bits of her Chinese confinement experience. I'll also be sharing footage I took of a real confinement center on a recent trip I took to China. And stick around to the end of the video from a medical perspective on the pros and cons of this approach to the first month of postpartum life. I always say to my patients, you are the expert on your own body, and I respect you. And this video is not medical advice, so feel free to disregard or disagree with anything I say. Now with that said, let's get started. I noticed that here in Asia, a lot of attention and resources are given to women after they give birth, especially when compared to where I'm from in Canada. This is very true also in the medical profession here in the West. Western medicine tends to pay a lot more attention to the baby after a woman gives birth than the mother herself. We have routine well baby checks at newborn, six weeks, two months, four months, six months, etc. But we only give new mothers a postpartum checkup at six weeks to make sure she doesn't have anything life-threatening and then usually she's on her own. And then there's many places and cultures that do some form of confinement for different lengths of time. Here in Hong Kong, many mothers opt for Chinese confinement known as Cho Yu. Good on you, Taylor, for immersing yourself in the local customs and trying this out. According to traditional Chinese medicine, the significant amounts of fluid and blood loss during childbirth cause the body to go into a state of yin, or cold. Therefore, we need to warm it up because when yin and yang are out of balance, the body is more prone to getting sick. Now this is actually a pretty good explanation of the rationale behind traditional Chinese confinement. I have nothing more to add except to note that this is the traditional Chinese medical way of thinking, and that this is obviously quite different from the way Western medicine thinks. So the purpose of confinement is for the mother to restore her body, have a stress-free environment to bond with her baby, protect against any potential post-delivery health problems, and eat special confinement foods. So in contrast, Western medicine believes that outside of a few serious illnesses postpartum, things can pretty much take care of themselves for the new mother after she gives birth. Compare that with traditional Chinese medicine, which believes that a lot of future health problems can arise for the mother if they don't do the first month confinement or if they do it incorrectly. And since we in Western medicine don't really have all the answers in terms of why diseases arise later on in life, who is to say traditional Chinese medicine is wrong? I can say that for hair loss specifically, at normal times, some hair is always being lost since different hair follicles in the scalp are at different stages of the hair growth cycle. But hair on the scalp normally pauses in its growth cycle during pregnancy and the cycle begins again after giving birth. And so postpartum, women oftentimes lose a lot of hair in the first couple months just because a lot of hair is entering the shedding phase of the cycle at the same time, not necessarily because there's anything wrong with the body. So medically speaking, doing the month confinement can't protect against hair loss. Eating restorative foods though is a great point. More on this later on in the video. During this time, some women get help with the traditional practices from their mother or mother-in-law, but this can cause strain on the relationship, especially if the woman feels forced to do things. So nowadays, a lot of people choose to go to confinement centers, which can be pretty pricey, or more commonly here in Hong Kong, hire a puyue or a confinement nanny. So why would anybody not choose the comfort of their own homes after delivering a baby? On a recent visit to China, I discovered that one of my friends who had recently given birth was actually living in a Chinese confinement center. So because visitors are allowed, I visited her at her confinement center. Let's take a look. My friend stayed at a fairly decent facility, not luxurious, but certainly had all the basics. Right when you walk in, you must be sterilized by a sterilization machine. The medical lead of the facility demonstrated it for me. What comes out of the machine is actually something called hypochlorous acid a mild and safe disinfectant that kills bugs on contact. 
Going into the area where postpartum women stayed, you can see mission statements and value flags adorning the walls of this facility. This particular mission statement states, everything for the mother and her baby. Notice what came first, everything for the mother. The mothers were housed in two room suites and in the doorway of every suite, there's a letter written by the mother to her baby, as well as the ID and biography of the confinement nanny serving the mother and providing one-on-one -on -one care for her. The room costs 20,000 yuan for one month. That's about 4,000 Canadian dollars. There's a living area, then there's the nanny herself, there's a table where necessities and snacks are kept, a bassinet for the baby, a place to hang dry baby clothes, a couch where the confinement nanny sleeps, and there's also a separate bedroom where the mother and her baby sleeps. What we can't see on this video is that this room is actually kept at 27 degrees Celsius or 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The goal after all is to expel the cold, which is perhaps why Taylor R. I had heard you weren't allowed to turn on the air conditioner and I was really worried about this, but that wasn't the case for me. It was actually encouraged for me to turn it on so that I could keep the baby and myself comfortable. It was just advised not to have the vent blowing directly on us. So you can have the air on, but it is recommended to cover up the body, especially the feet and shoulders. I'm pumping right now. <laughs> I knew this was coming. <laughs> Besides not being cold, Taylor then goes on to describe how the food in Chinese confinement supports both maternal warmth and recovery, as well as breast milk production for the baby. The food was probably one of my favorite parts about confinement. Carol had asked me ahead of time if I wanted to do the full traditional Chinese menu. This looks so good. My uh, bridal cells yes, are I want to so experience everything. Right uh, so with her arrival came an abundance of Chinese herbs and medicines. Uh, yeah, I have no idea what any of those herbs and medicines are for. Sorry. And the pantry that I carefully organized during my nesting phase turned into a Chinese medicine cabinet. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I wish I knew more about Chinese medicines. Maybe I'll do another degree on traditional Chinese medicine once I make enough YouTube revenue to pay for it. Which is why you should consider subscribing to my channel and sharing it with other viewers. Seriously, it's all to improve patient care. This one gives you more iron. One of the most important things to consume during confinement is red date tea. This tea is said to be full of many benefits for new mothers from boosting milk supply. This is the first of many comments about boosting milk supply. We are what we eat and blood circulation to calming nerves, relieving pain, reducing water retention, and preventing anemia. Wow. Improving circulation, calming nerves, relieving pain, reducing water retention, and preventing anemia. Why are we not all eating Chinese red dates every meal every day? See, this is actually one of my pet peeves in medicine. One fruit or vegetable cannot do all of these things for us. It's the raw nutrients in the food item combined with other nutrients as part of a well-balanced diet that give the body the foundational building blocks necessary to calm nerves, relieve pain, and so forth. I wouldn't go out and just exclusively buy and eat Chinese red dates if you're looking to prevent anemia. And as you can see from this nutrition information list, the Chinese red date is actually not so high in iron that it would prevent iron deficiency anemia all by itself, unless you eat hundreds and hundreds of these dates. But an interesting observation is that a lot of traditional Chinese medicine is color-based. Red dates are red, and blood is also red, and therefore eating red dates must be good for the blood. But Taylor actually does a good job of describing just how well-balanced her diet is, so let's keep watching. I was also introduced to many medicinal soups that were tailored to my personal healing journey and my form of delivery. Today's soup, what do you got? This one and this one make uh, more milk. Okay. Ah, again, no worries about breast milk supply in Chinese confinement. And then this and that one, that one, take out the water uh -huh. from your body. By the way, this confinement nanny should be our clinic dietitian. And then there was the ultimate lactating soup, the fish papaya soup. So in Western medicine, we oftentimes suggest boosting milk supply with a medication called Domperidone. But perhaps we should be learning from Chinese medicine and eating more of these foods instead. My diet was adequate in everything, but I'd say there was a really strong focus on fats and proteins. Fats and proteins are two main macronutrients and are the basic building blocks that support healing and recovery. So this makes sense. 
A lot of the foods were either steamed or stir-fried in very little oil. A lot of fish, leafy green vegetables, steamed rice, and then a lot of beneficial ingredients were added on top, such as uh, sesame seeds. So I am super impressed by the diversity and well-balanced nature of these meals. If people ate these meals every day as part of their daily lives, I'd probably be out of a job. Or at least doctors won't need to deal with society's epidemic of diabetes and high blood pressure and all these other lifestyle-related disorders. I vote for having confinement food every day. Every day, Carol puts some black sesame seeds on my rice because she said it's good for hair loss. They provide copper, magnesium, calcium, fatty acids, iron, zinc, phosphorus, B1 vitamins, amino acids, selenium, and antioxidants, which are vital for a nourished scalp and hair. Again, it's interesting. A lot of Chinese medicine is color-based. Black sesame is black, and most Chinese people's hair is black. Therefore, eating black sesame must be good for the hair. But actually, if you look at black sesame's nutritional information, there's all that in just 14 grams or 2 tablespoons of black sesame, 15% of one's daily iron needs, 18% of daily calcium needs, 37% of daily copper needs. Very good superfood here. I can see why they add it during Chinese confinement. A lot of warming ingredients such as Chinese cooking wine, sesame oil, and ginger were used. And there is also a lot of focus on foods that are said to help increase milk supply, such as peanuts, millet, papaya, sesame seeds. <laughs> oh my god. Can, can make more meal, okay? <laughs> oh yes. no. So again, no worries about breast milk supply in Chinese confinement. I guess the point of the meals was to refuel the body, but also keep it in a very balanced zen state. So nothing that would induce bloating, gas, more water retention, inflammation, or irritation. This could be an avenue of further growth in Western medicine. We are what we eat, and what we eat does make a difference. And it's not as well taught in medical schools as it perhaps should be. I know that eating raw or slightly cooked foods take more energy to chew and digest, and cold foods also take more energy and time to digest because the, the body needs to heat it up. So I think this diet is all about getting nutrient-dense foods into the body at an optimal temperature so that they're easily absorbed and the body can use its energy to do other more important things such as healing. This makes sense chemically and physiologically. You basically help the body pre-digest food by cooking it and heating it. Makes sense. Breastfeeding was the thing I was most worried about. I knew I would get through labor and delivery one way or another, but I wasn't sure if I would be able to breastfeed, and that was something I personally really wanted to do. I had wondered about breastfeeding in Chinese confinement. Breastfeeding is something that modern Western medicine strongly encourages mothers to do. Slogans like breast is best try to convey the fact that breast milk not only contains the best and most tailored nutrients for the baby, but also contains antibodies that protect the baby from disease. So good on you for trying breastfeeding, Taylor. Along with preparing special foods to facilitate milk production, Carol also taught me proper latching and holding techniques, gave me breast massages. It's like blocked? Yeah. Because baby, the mouth lock, the, the shade not good. Oh. That's true. Babies do have smaller mouths. And in order to latch properly to the nipple, they actually must hold the entire areola, or the front part of the breast, in their mouth, not just the nipple. You can imagine how, for small babies with small mouths, that's extremely hard to do, especially for preterm babies. You know, if he is for very painful, and then the, some husband to, to sucking. The husband? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> Well. Okay, so husband jokes aside, babies sucking on the breast is a popular misconception. Infants don't suck the nipple the way we suck from a straw. There is actually no negative pressure created by the infant's mouth. Instead, infants are actually using their tongue to push the breast in their mouth against the roof of their mouth. So they're actually massaging and pushing the milk out. This is a reflex for the baby. All babies know how to do this from birth. And again, as you saw, it's not a sucking motion. So husbands, if you're trying to help your spouses unblock their ducks, don't suck in all senses of the term. And then that time you get painful and fever, the husband can help you. <laughs> yes. Okay, can you move the slide? We decide so clinically, blocked ducks can cause something called mastitis, which is an infection of the breast. And so whenever the breasts feel painful or hot or red or swollen, we gotta be thinking about that. We actually treat mastitis by massaging some of the blocked ducts back into the chest wall, away from the nipple, in addition to massaging the milk closer to the nipple 
towards and out through the nipple. And also keep in mind, because this is an infection, the patient will frequently need antibiotics to kill the bacteria causing the infection. So if you ever get severe pain or swelling or redness or heat in the breast, please call your family doctor. I done supplementing with formula at first, and I would breastfeed as well as pump in between to get my supply up during the day, and then I would also pump at night. Now all mothers will know that this is not as easy as it sounds. In early postpartum, if the breast is not stimulated regularly, at least 10 times a day according to some lactation consultants in the first few days postpartum, the mother's milk supply may not come in as readily, or at all, or she may lose her supply. Now obviously, at night, waking up every two or three hours to do this is going to be quite hard. But I'm going to pump through the night, I pump and then Carol feeds the baby. So I just pump and then I go back to sleep. My friend who stayed in the Chinese confinement center also did this. She pumped at night to maintain her breast milk supply. And the nanny just feeds the express breast milk to the baby to give the mother some time to sleep. If Carol wasn't with me, I probably would have given up on breastfeeding. It was really hard and it took a long time for my milk to come in. And during that time, I felt so discouraged. Yeah, we were taught in medical school that breastfeeding is a very vulnerable time in a mother's life when she's prone to developing mental health conditions like postpartum depression, especially if she's not getting enough sleep. But I admit, before I personally experienced what my wife went through breastfeeding, I had no idea how hard breastfeeding actually is. So when it comes to feeding the baby, what's best for the baby is actually not what's best for the mom. So how does Chinese confinement balance that? Would the focus on increased maternal rest during Chinese confinement lead to reduced breast milk production? I wasn't able to find scientific studies exploring this question. So if you're aware of any, please leave a comment down below and let me know. But clearly, Taylor here is working very hard, pumping her milk and continuing with breastfeeding, and having a confinement nanny to help her with this process can make it easier for other breastfeeding mothers as well. I was producing barely anything and didn't know if it was going to happen for me, but Carol kept reassuring me that it will come, it will come, and it finally did at the three week mark. I finally started producing enough to feed my son and I was so excited. For Taylor, it took three weeks, but it can take up to six weeks for a new mother to fully establish her milk supply. And during that time, even if you don't have a confinement nanny, there are resources out there in Canada to help you succeed during this difficult time please feel free to reach out to your family doctor or lactation consultant at any time. In the past, bathing was completely restricted during confinement. This was a long time ago. There definitely wasn't any instant showers around. There probably wasn't even a lot of indoor showers, um, no towels, no heaters, or any of the electronic gadgets that we have today. Uh, nowadays, it is definitely permitted and encouraged to have good hygiene. So bathing in confinement was restricted because exposure to water cools the body and runs counter to the goal of keeping the body warm at all times. Studies actually show that there's a wide diversity of practices across different parts of the world in the extent to which women during the month practice personal hygiene. Even in modern times, 47% of women during the confinement do not bathe most of the time. However, the Chinese confinement center I visited in China did allow for bathing, as each suite contained a bathroom that contained a shower, as well as a sink for brushing one's teeth. I'm ready to take my first confinement shower and I am not allowed to use just regular water. I have to bathe in ginger water. Again, different people do this differently around the world. From the research, bathing in ginger water seems to be the standard of practice only in Hong Kong. In Scotland, Chinese women actually put vodka in their bath water. The first time I did it, I looked like a lobster. My body went completely red. It was kind of scary. I thought I was allergic to it. This doesn't look like an allergy, more like contact dermatitis or just a mild reaction to the hot water. But then the more I did it, the less red I got and the more I got used to it and even into it. Yeah, definitely not an allergy. A true allergic reaction would get stronger with repeated exposures to the allergen. The traditional practice of wrapping the belly post childbirth is an ancient art implemented in Asia, Africa, Europe, and Latin America. So I don't read that wrapping is a typical practice in Chinese confinement, according to this literature review that I found from PubMed. I wonder if, again, it's a regional practice specific to Hong Kong. 
If you know the answer, let me know in the comments. Holding. The point of this belly wrapping is not to bounce back. It's done to heal the abdominal muscle wall, support the core, back, and pelvic floor, help overall posture, and aid in placing the organs and stretch of skin back in place. Okay, so in many ways, wrapping could make sense. First, it could prevent hernia formation by putting pressure on one's intestines and preventing them from being pushed out through abdominal muscles that may have gotten weak after childbirth. And especially if the mother had had a C-section, then wrapping could help hold together the layers of skin, muscle, and other connective tissues, preventing the sutures from tearing open and letting the tissues heal together again faster. I do wonder if there's a relationship between wrapping after delivery and the incidence of organ prolapse later in life. But I should mention that wrapping alone does not strengthen one's core muscles. Strengthening is done through doing various things such as cardiovascular exercise and dedicated core strength training. Whenever we want to strengthen muscles, we don't just bind them, we have to activate and use them. One of my patients who just gave birth, she's a physiotherapist, and she recommends yoga or gentle Pilates as a way to get back into a conditioned state. You can also find dedicated pelvic floor physiotherapists that can help improve your pelvic floor muscle strength. Here in the Chinese Confinement Center, there's a yoga studio dedicated to helping women get some physical exercise. It's tight, but not unbearable. I can still sit down. There's still like, there's some give to it. It feels very held together. I feel good. I feel comfy. I feel secure. I feel ready for the day. Comfy, secure ready for the day. So even if wrapping doesn't have any physical benefits, the psychological benefits seem worth it. What the mother feels is so important in the vulnerable postpartum period. And this is an area of emphasis that Western medicine and Western medical school systems can learn from. We do a great job of preventing life-threatening outcomes in postpartum women, such as deep vein thromboses or blood clots, but we can definitely do a better job of actually caring about how a woman feels after childbirth. My son was so well taken care of. He always had someone there when he needed them. And my husband and I were able to learn so much, everything from how to feed him to hygiene, toys he could play with, ways that we could settle him. So Taylor's experience here seems to be a bit different from traditional Chinese confinement. Traditionally, the emphasis of confinement has more to do with the mother resting, sleeping, recovering, and restoring the balance between yin and yang in her body, and for other people to be looking after the baby. And it's really up to the mother for how hands-on she wants to be. If she wants to do every single feeding and diaper change and rocking back to sleep and playing everything, she can. Uh, or if she wants to take breaks every now and then, then she can. The Chinese confinement nanny I spoke with tells me that in their center is mostly the nanny that looks after the baby during the first month. And there's also a couple of differences such as not promoting skin to skin between mother and baby, unlike what we teach in the West, given that mothers are not supposed to expose their skin to the cold. Also, mothers are not supposed to hold the baby in their first month. Given that pregnancy-related hormones are still settling down during that first month after childbirth, I do think that not holding excessively heavy things during this time period of transition may be helpful. Waiting until the body is at a pre-pregnancy hormonal baseline to hold heavy things like the baby may help to prevent the onset of many musculoskeletal complications of pregnancy, such as carpal tunnel syndrome. And then there's just so many different things that happen to a newborn, like different rashes and poo colors and things that look strange. So it was really nice to have a professional there that I could ask all these questions to, or else I would have drove the doctors crazy with millions of questions. Don't worry, Taylor, you won't be driving us crazy. It's our job to help you and other postpartum women. Then again, maybe that's why the medical profession in the West has not endorsed confinement nannies or the practice of confinement, because we may be out of a job. So we were finished confinement. Was I your first Caucasian mom? Yeah, yes. In my experience, yes. Yeah. So again, good on you, Taylor, for trying a different cultural experience. When I asked the nanny at the Chinese Confinement Center why Western people typically don't do a month's confinement, she tells me that she believes Chinese women's bodies to be different from Western bodies and must undergo a different type of recovery to maintain good health after childbirth. Taylor's nanny seems to think so as well. And maybe after born the baby, they care the body mm. to recover well and then yeah. Yeah, don't go out and your body uh, totally to get yeah. a time to recover. Yeah. yeah, and you think that makes a difference later in life? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So let's see what the research has to say about the potential benefits and drawbacks of doing the month's confinement. I can say that I feel very relaxed 
and empowered and just very well equipped to handle anything either mentally or physically that comes my way. In terms of benefits, doing the month presents a formal transition to motherhood for the new mother. Having others attend to the mom during this time and providing abundant personal and infant care symbolically acknowledges her and the sacrifices she has made to produce a child for the family. This formal acknowledgement and respect demonstrated to the mother might just prevent her from developing postpartum depression or even from feeling the typical guilt and insecurity that many new mothers experience after childbirth. As you saw in the video, the abundance of carefully curated healthy foods, as well as other supportive practices, can all help to facilitate postpartum recovery. And who knows, since Western medicine still don't really understand why a lot of diseases arise, doing the month could certainly help prevent future diseases. We have no evidence to say that confinement does not do that. Now, in terms of potential risks, resting at home for a month could lead to cardiovascular and physical deconditioning, which could be hard to recover from. Western medicine recommends that new mothers regularly get physical exercise when she's able to do so after childbirth. This helps her lose the weight gained in pregnancy and also reduces the risk of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Another potential risk is that the lack of sunlight could potentially lead to vitamin D deficiency and other vitamin D-related bone disorders like rickets. Not brushing teeth or having minimal cleaning could lead to dental issues or skin rash. From one study, 9% of women have oral disease after childbirth when doing months confinement. And for some women, the need to strictly adhere to traditional Chinese confinement practices may paradoxically cause increased stress and increase her risk of postpartum depression, rather than reducing it. But looking at this list of risks, they can all be mitigated in one way or another, such as simply taking vitamin D supplements, or having a dedicated room to do yoga or Pilates during confinement. So a big thank you, Taylor, for sharing your experiences and communicating your feelings in such a real and authentic manner. Certainly, the Chinese practice of emphasizing care for the mother just as much as care for the baby is something Western medicine could learn from. Multiple times I've had burnt out mothers in my practice feeling guilty that they were burnt out or who wanted medication for mental health issues simply because they were sleep deprived and didn't know that it was okay to try to look after themselves as much as they were looking after the baby. Yes, the baby is vulnerable and deserves support, but so are postpartum mothers, especially first time mothers. But like I said at the beginning, we're all different. The ideal postpartum experience is going to be different for different women. So if you disagree with anything I said, that's okay, I respect your opinion. And now that you've watched this video from a medical perspective, what are your thoughts on Chinese confinement? Pop your comments down below, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.